no idea he was my neighbor. I heard those words in 2004 when I was in Kenya working on a project, and they haunted me till today. I had no idea he was my neighbor. In 2004, I went to Kenya, and I was working with a nonprofit NGO to gather the stories of the people that they were serving, AIDS, orphans, and widows, bring those stories back to the U.S., and use those stories to illustrate the work of this particular NGO. And in doing that, we identified a few people that they were serving. And one of these people was named Caxton. This is Caxton Odiambo. At the time, in 2004, he was 14 years old, and he lost everybody in his family that's older than him. And in Africa, they have extended families. That's, that's everybody, aunts, uncles, father, mother, et cetera, et cetera. So here's this 14-year-old that lost everybody in his family except for his two younger uh, siblings, a brother and a sister. And he was responsible for taking care of these two kids. So Caxton lived on this side of the street in Kenya. Mrs. Mobewa lived on that side of the street in Kenya, about a 20-minute walk. She had, she, when she heard Caxton's story and heard what was going on in his life, she was shocked. And she said to me, I had no idea Caxton was suffering the way he was. I had no idea that he sold every single thing he owned just to pay for school fees, to pay for uniform, to pay for soap for his uniform, because you're sent home if your uniform's dirty. She had no idea that he was his neighbor, her neighbor, until we did this project. TEDx, love your neighbors, really. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and the why about me, like where do I come from and why on earth do I care about stories in the first place. So roughly around the same age, when I was about 13 years old or so, my whole family fell apart. There was alcoholism, there was violence, there was mental illness, there was abuse and severe neglect. And I was sort of living in my own world, in my, in my house. And I took to journaling. And I journaled and I journaled and I journaled. I really didn't have anybody to talk to, so this is where I told my story. And I, told, and I have boxes of these today. And I was telling myself my own story to survive until I met Mitch Zeman. And Mitch Zeman was the pastor of my church, and he noticed something is wrong with Amanda. Like, her grades are falling, she's looking cross-eyed at teachers, she's getting behavior marks and things like that at school. Serious problems were going on in my life. And so he finally pulled me aside and said, Amanda, what's going on? Like, what's going on at home? And so finally I just opened up to him and I told him my story. And my entire life changed. So Mitch Zeman found me a respite mom. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but it's not quite fostering, but it's, it's sort of this in-between between having parents and not having parents. So this one, there was all these closed doors meetings at my church, and this one woman raised her hand, Mrs. Green, who's since passed away, and said, I'll take Amanda, I'll let her live with me, and I'll raise her until she graduates high school. And I'll make sure that within our community, people teach her how to apply for school, because my family was out of the picture. They teach her how to apply for school. They teach her how to get a, a job. They make sure she gets rides. She stays for university and goes. And I did. And it happened. And to this day, I, I owe them my life for listening. And I owe my community for teaching me the things that my family couldn't teach me myself, themselves. So then I went to university, and I studied anthropology. And at the same time, I decided to study photography because I thought that would get me a leg up on other anthropologists. But then I fell in love with photography. And so these are sort of my humble beginnings. That center enlarger right there was my enlarger. And that's my enlarger a couple years ago. It's like since been fixed up and repaired. Like it was pretty bad shape. It was really humble beginnings. But that doesn't matter because in that dark room built some sort of a passion in me like became alive. A way that I could actually show stories. I could not only tell stories but I could show them. And I could create stories about other people that were like me and I could help them. And I felt like if somebody could see these stories and you see what's going on in other people's lives, maybe it could change their lives for the better. So I became this photographer. I became this photojournalist, this international photojournalist, and my career went nuts. And so I was traveling around the world. It was very cool, and I'm very grateful. And I was traveling around the world. I was working with NGOs in all these different countries, shooting for all these magazines and just magazines you've heard of, and it was awesome. And so when that happened, now a publisher came to me and they said, oh, we want to make a book of your work. Can we just make a book of your work? You know, a lot of people have to go, like, push their book to a publisher, and a publisher came to me, and I was like, yeah, sure, go ahead, make a book of my work. 
So while this was happening, I was getting all these emails, email upon email after email, saying, Amanda, I want to take you to coffee. Amanda, I want to pick your brain. How do I learn how to do what you did so that I can do what you're doing? And I mean, hundreds of emails came in, so that's really bad math, right? So there's all these emails and me. Like, it's impossible for me to respond to all these emails. So I thought, all right, so there's all this energy going on. All these people want to learn these things. I can't possibly teach them to everything, everybody. So what, I, what was possible was to take all these emails and make a folder on my computer and call it Coffee Talk, because all these people wanted to take me to coffee and pick my brain. I don't even drink coffee. But anyway, I made a call. I called it Coffee Talk because they did. So here's this folder on my, on my computer with all these names, all this information, all these requests, all these needs, all these people that want to know how to do this. And so I thought, OK, there's a possibility here. What on earth could I do with this? So I decided to create this thing called Salam Garage. It was sort of just, just an experiment. I thought to myself, OK, all these people want to go on these trips, and they want to come with me on assignments and carry my bags and do all this sort of boring stuff. Like, that's not really doing it yourself, right? So what I did was do this experiment. And in 2007, I decided to lead a group to India and work with a national, or a small, sorry, a very small NGO that helps street kids in India get them off the streets and into a really, like, sort of a foster home kind of situation. And so I built this relationship with this small grassroots NGO, and that stands for non-government organization, for those who don't know, it's sort of like a nonprofit that serves these homeless kids. And so I built the relationship and set up projects in advance, and a whole, I, I contacted all those coffee talk people, and they saw a bunch of them, enough of them signed up for the trip, or the trip was a go. So we went to India, and instead of people doing what I was doing, they did it for themselves. And so Salam Garage looked, oh, and so when I formed Salam Garage, of course, you can't do anything without a team. So I had to build a team. So this was the first international Salam Garage team. So I found leaders, other photojournalists, web geeks, social media geeks, because I had no idea what was going on with social media in 07. And so I had this awesome team. We led this trip, and people had to pay for the trips. And so what people would do was use this crowdfunding, right? Like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, et cetera. And what would happen with this crowdfunding, this was for a trip that we led to Ethiopia, was there were people in these, pe these particular people's communities that wanted to go on the trips, and then there were people that were going to go on, people that wanted to go on the trips but couldn't take the time off, and the people could take the time off but couldn't afford it. And so what they did was raise money from their friends and families, et cetera, and so now all these people were getting involved with these trips and with these nonprofits. So even though they were fundraising, people were learning about the Ham Hamlin Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia. So it was sort of this indirect aw aw awareness raising. So this is what Salam Garage trips look like. These are either amateur or professional photographers, and this is at the Hamlin Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia. And it's very one-on-one. -on -one. It's not what I call a drive-by shooting, where you like take a bunch of pictures and then you leave the country. You're actually like talking to people, learning about what their needs are, learning about their life, what is fistula, what happens to you after you get the uh, surgery, etc. So, and then there was a lot of one-on-one -on -one sharing, and it was awesome. And so, Salam Garage, what would happen is people would come home, they would have exhibitions, and they, well, they would take this content and they would plug it into their online or their offline communities. Online, obviously, social media, and offline, people started having these exhibitions, and then the press would show up, and then stuff got published in newspapers when there were more newspapers, and things went on Flickr, and people were tagging things, and then there were links to the nonprofit, and people were raising money for the nonprofit. It was really cool. And so all these different articles were coming out, and all this information was getting out there about the nonprofits and the awesome work that they were doing. Even Hold on a sec. Even Blurb, we had a partnership with Blurb, but they would publish a book after every, all of our trips. So things were moving. Like, this was a machine. So Salam Garage was a good machine. Like, people were going on the trips. Trips were happening all around the world. Content was getting out there. People who didn't know what fistula was, people who didn't know where Ethiopia was, all of a sudden did. So that's good. It's working. But then something happened to me. And I came home. I, was, I live in Seattle, and I was... I was home one day, and I was leaving church. And I left church one morning, and I was talking to my friend, Karen Gatch. And, I was, and all of a sudden, I was just overwhelmed with my own experience as a kid. 
And I was just thinking to myself, man, here I am in my own city, and yet I'm traveling all around the world helping all these folks, which need help and telling stories that need to be told. But what about my community? And what am I doing in Seattle? All I do is fly home here after Salam Garage trips. So as I was leaving the church, and I talked to my friend Karen, I said, you see those condos up there and those apartment buildings up there, et cetera? I know that in those rooms that there are kids like Caxton and there are kids like me. And I know for sure there are kids in there that need help. Kids that need to learn how to write. Their parents are not teaching them life skills like how do you write a resume and how do you grocery shop and how do you meal plan? How on earth do I apply for college? I knew that that was happening because that was me. I grew up in a town that looks, it looks like there's not one problem going on. It's very, I grew up in a very well-educated school, uh, town, high income, et cetera. And meanwhile, my house was a living hell. And so I knew in Seattle the same thing was going on. I can't, people, we think we're the exception to everything, but we're actually not. I know that this is going on. So I looked at these two blocks and I said, I've got to do something about my neighbors. I've got to do something about my community. And so I redirected Salam Garage. I redirected the focus to Salam Garage Local. And so once again, I built a team because how on earth are you going to do anything if you don't have an awesome team? And so one of the leaders in New York City named Maggie Soliday and I, we we're good friends, and she's also one of the main leaders for Global. We were on the phone one day, and I said, Maggie, you know, we got to do local. And she said, I'm, I'm totally in. Let's do it. And so now we're like, well, what are we going to take on? I mean, there's a million things going on everywhere that we could take on, and where do we start? And she, had, she happened to come across this article in the New York Times about what happens to kids in New York City when they age out of foster care. And it's not pretty. Sometimes when kids age out of foster care, they literally leave the house with, not, with a bag, like with a bag of clothes, and that's it. And they're expected to know how to write, to do all the typical life skills that most of you learn in the course of 10 years when you live with your family. And that's totally impossible, right? So I said, you know, done deal. Let's do kids who age out of foster care. So the way that Salam Garage gathered people was through Meetup, and so we built communities of Salam Garage local in New York City. Now we're doing it in Seattle and hopefully in other cities. We built this, this group of, you know, there's a lot of tags with Meetup, so we just found all the right, like the, you know, the strategic tags and everything, and people just showed up. They wanted to do storytelling in their own community, and we were able to leverage the brand of Salam Garage. So this is what Salam Garage, La <laughs> Salam Garage Local looks like. I know a lot of you are going to wonder why it's called Salam Garage, and I'll tell you later. But um, it <laughs> takes too much time. So it looks like this. People hanging out on the upper right is one of the folks that's actually being interviewed. He looks, I don't know, maybe in his 40s or something, and he aged out of foster care and has been homeless ever since. And the rest are the different teams. And so... We got into this, right? And so not only did we get into this project, we started researching. Because it's kind of a good idea, as Dana was saying, it's kind of a good idea. If you're going to get into something, you better find out, you know, who are the experts, what are the stats, kind of know what you're talking about. So there were two statistics that knocked me over the head that haunt me. And one of them is that one in five kids who age out of foster care ends up homeless on the streets. And one in four ends up in jail. And I'm not okay with that, you know? I didn't age out of foster care, but I could have been one of those people. And that doesn't look like the TEDx stage, right? Jail and homeless, it looks a lot different. And somehow I got lucky because my community stepped in and helped me through that hard time. And the, other, the third thing that really shocked us with this project was the how do I questions. The people that, so what we ended up doing was hooking up with different foster care agencies and finding people that had aged out of foster care. And through those interviews, we found these questions came up over and over. How do I make bills work? How do I make, uh, make a budget? How do I, a hundred how do I's. And they're, again, they're all like simple life skills that I'm going to guess most of you probably take for granted. And you don't even think about it when you write a resume or whatever. You don't even think about it. You know where to find the templates. You ask your friend. You copy somebody else's or whatever. You build on your last one. These kids, these youth, don't know how to do that. But if they did, could you think of the progress? There's so many diamonds in the rough. There's so many more 
potential TED speakers out there than there are TED speakers. So after that project in New York, they did this, the uh, global started looking like local. No, local started looking like global. They did fundraising and they raised money for an exhibition. They had this awesome exhibition at the Long Island Children's Museum and raised awareness about people who age out of foster care at the Children's Museum. And they raised funds in New York City to do family portraits and things like that. And they built, they published a book and the book is out in the, in the lobby. Um, and the book got reviewed, it got excellent reviews. That's the cover of it. Um, and some, I don't know, some like really well-known country star was, was aged out of foster care and he started tweeting about it and that of course helped us out a lot. And so it just took off through social media. But I think what's different about what we're doing with Salam Garage is that we're first building things on the one-on-one -on -one connection, like meeting face-to-face, -face, and then we're blasting that content into social media versus the reverse. So then um, some of these stories ended up in ABC News, which is what we wanted. We wanted to raise awareness. We wanted to know people that aging out of foster care is a real thing, and those statistics are real, and they're not okay. We had no idea that she was our neighbor. So I ask you, San Luis Obispo, who is your neighbor? <laughs> who are your neighbors? I hear there's a really huge homeless problem in this city. Do you know them? Do you know why they're homeless? Were some of them foster kids that aged out and they just need to know how to write a resume? They just need to get, get a nice outfit to wear to a, a job interview? Like why? And who are your neighbors? So I now challenge you, San Luis Obispo, TEDx, Cal Polytech. What is the how do I that you can answer? What's the one how do I that you can help out with? So we have a booth up front. And I thought that I would challenge all of you to take your business card. I know a lot of your students, so if a, a post-it will work as a business card. Um, take your business card, and on the back of it, write that one thing that you can teach, that one how do I that you can meet, and drop it in the fishbowl that's up front. And actually, TEDx has offered to um, volunteer on the follow-up, and follow up with all of you, manage that, and plug you in with people that you can teach and you can help. You can teach one thing, one time to one person for one hour. That's it. And, I, and believe me, you will make the biggest difference in someone's life. I mean, I'm living proof. So I challenge you, TEDx, to love your neighbor, really. Thank you.